Have you always really wanted to make an impact when speaking in public? Does the idea of speaking to a room full of people leave you feeling nervous? If so, then this is the course for you. We'll be looking at how to properly prepare your content, voice and body so you can really shine on the day. Firstly, we'll cover preparation techniques, including presentation structure and the art of storytelling. We'll then focus on how we can transfer our message in the best way, through body language and eliminating verbal tics. Finally, we'll look at how to prepare for various professional contexts, such as speaking at a conference, delivering a presentation to camera, and also attending a job interview. Becoming a good public speaker is all about preparation and practice. With the help of the tips and ideas on this course, you'll be on your way in no time. Sign up now. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out the full course on Open Classrooms. Hello, and welcome to this introductory course on public speaking. Now, I'm guessing that you're here because you either have to speak in public soon or you want to improve your impact when speaking in public in general. Whatever your profession may be, you'll have an opportunity to speak in public at some point. That may be in a small meeting room for five people or a large conference for 100. Outside the professional context, you could be asked to speak in public at a party or even at a wedding. Whatever the situation, speaking in public can be quite daunting. In fact, studies have shown that public speaking is many people's worst fear, and this can be hard to admit to. We might be worried that people will judge us or think that we're not good enough to do our job, despite having ample experience. If that's the case, you're in good company. Even teachers and actors that have been speaking in public for years will tell you that they still feel those famous butterflies in their stomach before they go into class or on stage. It is those nerves, or in other words, that energy, that reminds them that they want to do a good job and that they're there for a specific reason. As an actress and public speaking trainer, I need to speak in public on stage, on camera, or in a classroom. The irony is, is I'm painfully shy. However, after many years of practice and the right planning before a class or performance, I have learned to control my nerves. I now use them to my advantage. I view every time I speak in public as a performance. Based on the context, I take on a specific character or play a role. Depending on my audience, I can be serious or funny. Treating your speech as a performance can help recenter your focus onto your content. Additionally, you don't have to be a naturally charismatic speaker or an extrovert to be a good public speaker. The key to a good presentation or performance is preparation. Preparation allows you to focus on what, when, and why you are speaking. By narrowing all the elements down, you become familiar with your subject. It allows you to not only give a more concise presentation, but to reduce fear of the unknown. Less fear of the unknown means fewer nerves and therefore more confidence on the actual day. Preparation is not limited to the subject matter, however. Preparing and warming up your body and vocal cords, as well as creating a positive mindset, are also key to success. Remember, our body and mind are the tools we use to transmit our message. The more warmed up and ready they are, the more successful we will be in grabbing and maintaining our audience's attention. We all start off at different levels. However, by the end of this course, you will have learned that with the right tools, anybody can become a good public speaker. So now, what is the first thing we need to figure out before speaking in public? That would be to clearly define the objective of our speech. And that's what we'll be looking at in the next chapter. When preparing your presentation, the first thing you should ask yourself is, who has requested that I give this speech or presentation? What is our relationship and what is their role? For example, are they your manager, a colleague, or an acquaintance? Once you have done that, you need to get as many answers as possible to the following questions. Who, how, when, what, and why? Answering these questions will allow you to have a defined plan. It will also make it easier to adapt your speech to your audience. Making your presentation as relevant as possible will help you maintain your audience's attention. Let's start with the first question. Who? Who are you going to be speaking to? Will it be a group of 200 people, 20 people, or five? 
Depending on the size of your audience, the way you express your content will be different. You should also ask yourself, how familiar is my audience with the subject I'm going to present? Are they beginners or experts? Will you be speaking to a tech-savvy crowd, a room full of managers or students? By determining the demographic, you will be able to adjust your vocabulary accordingly. There's nothing worse than attending a presentation where the speaker assumes that the audience has the exact same background and knowledge as them. Inevitably, you get lost in the jargon, lose your concentration and stop listening to the speaker. The second question you need to ask yourself is how? How will your presentation be made? Will it be face to face, remote or online, live or pre-recorded? You must also consider what equipment you will have at your disposal. Will you have a microphone? And if so, will it be worn or handheld? Also, will you be able to use slides for your presentation? Will there be a projector? Will a remote control be available or will you have to get one? Depending on these answers, your hand gestures will differ. You'll also know if you have the possibility of carrying notes. The third question is, when? When do I have to give this presentation? More importantly, how long does the presentation have to be? Will it be two hours, one hour or five minutes? By defining the date and length of the presentation, you'll know how much time you have to prepare yourself. The next question is what? What are you going to talk about exactly? It might sound obvious, but it's important to be able to prepare a well-structured speech. This means not getting sidetracked on details that aren't relevant. Finally, the most important question is why? Why have you been asked to give this presentation? What makes you the best person for the job? Are you an expert on the subject? Do you have any experience to share? Maybe you've got certain qualities that can bring life to the presentation, such as a good sense of humor. The point is, you need to know why you are there. Is it to inform, teach, or inspire your audience? Write all this information down. Your ideas and plans will stem from the answers to these questions. It will also serve as an outline for your draft. Here's a trick for getting started. Make two columns, a before and an after. Under the before column, you can write down everything you think your audience will know before the presentation. In the after column, know everything that you want your audience to retain from your presentation. From here, bridge the before and after by creating a middle column. This will be the content of your presentation. Try it out for yourself. Becoming a good public speaker is essentially all about telling a good story. And by using the art of storytelling, you'll find it much easier to piece your story together. So, what is storytelling? Storytelling is a term that has been popularized in recent years by the world of marketing and communication, but in fact, it has existed for centuries. It's efficient because it allows you to transmit a message from one human being to another by activating their emotions such as empathy and sensitivity. It's true that it's much easier for our brain to retain a story rather than a concept. And that's because it's easy to remember something that has had an emotional effect on us. That could be either a story that made us laugh or something that reminds us of our childhood. Now, a lot of people who struggle with speaking in public will say that it's impossible for them as they're not charismatic speakers and they don't know how to tell stories. Rest assured, anybody can learn. In reality, the majority of people who are successful public speakers or give fantastic presentations were not born that way. They're in fact very well trained. Being a good public speaker really is a case of practice makes perfect. For those of us who struggle with shyness, you must remember that in fact being shy is not a weakness. It can be used as an advantage, as it can show a certain human aspect in the speaker that allows the audience to identify with them. What works in storytelling are the details, the subtleties, the failings which make up the charm of the speaker. So what are the rules and ingredients to becoming a good storyteller? Well, you'll find them anywhere as they are used to create all of our favorite series, films, and books. It's always the same rules. So what are these components? First of all, you have the hero. Then you have their particular quest, followed by their objective. 
After that, you have the auxiliary characters and events which help them in their quest and have a positive effect. Finally, you have the opponents, which could be the enemies or negative events which will try to ruin the hero's quest. Every story has the same structure and begins by point A and ends with point B. In between, a variety of things happen. The first incident shows cause for concern, followed by another series of incidents that show the adventure and struggles of the hero. Finally, there is the resolution, which marks the end of the story. In order to understand the concept of storytelling and help you to build the content for your personal speech, we'll be analyzing the well-known animated film, The Little Mermaid, by using the concepts of storytelling. And keep in mind, most films, especially romantic comedies, musicals, and other happy ending or feel-good movies follow the same structure. So let's take the story of The Little Mermaid and have a closer look at the components. First of all, who is the hero? Princess Ariel, or otherwise known as Little Mermaid. What is her quest? To have legs. What is her objective? To be able to walk and therefore join human beings in their world. Now, let's take a look at her auxiliaries. We have Flounder and Sebastian, and at the end, her father who agrees to help her have legs. Finally, who are her opponents? Ursula, of course, but we can also consider the fact that she's a mermaid and doesn't have legs. Her father could also be seen as an opponent at the beginning of the film. So, we have the components of the story. Now let's look at the structure. What is the Little Mermaid's initial situation? The initial situation is that Ariel meets and falls in love with Eric, a human being. What is the cause for concern? King Triton, Ariel's father, who is furious at the fact she has approached human beings, forbids her to go near humans again and destroys her possessions and memories associated with Eric. Like any good story, you have a variety of incidents. Let's have a look at them. By defying her father's authority, Ariel put herself in danger by making a pact with Ursula for her magic powers. She is given legs for three days, but in exchange loses her voice. She discovers the human world, then becomes a mermaid again, and Ursula's captive. Then of course we have the resolution, which is when her father fights and overcomes Ursula and then transforms his daughter into a human. So what is the resolved situation? Ariel can live happily ever after with Eric in the human world. The story might seem a little bit naive to begin with, but the great thing is that the structure can be reproduced and adapted to any content, even a professional content, which is what we're going to look at in the next chapter. Of course, a professional presentation is neither a fairy tale nor a romantic comedy. The content is usually a bit more abstract. The hero could become an idea, or even a company, or in a more complex point of view, the hero could be multiple, for example, when speaking about a community or a group of individuals. Modern stories such as lectures, courses, and speeches are far more subtle. The structure is often disguised and the components or characters are sometimes metaphors. In order to demonstrate this idea, we're going to do the same exercise we did with The Little Mermaid, but this time we're going to analyze the most viewed TED Talk of all time, a conference by Ken Robinson. Ken Robinson's ability to use well-structured speech peppered with anecdotes and humor really allows him to connect with the audience, and their reactions show us how good he is at it. His speech becomes memorable as well as inspiring. So take a moment, watch the conference, and we'll analyze it afterwards. Welcome back. So let's take a closer look at Ken Robinson's conference. What are the components? First of all, who is the hero in the speech? Well, here we have multiple heroes as he's talking about children in a general manner. What is a children's quest? They love learning and discovering. What is the objective? To put it quite simply, they want to do what they love and what makes them happy. What are the auxiliaries? The auxiliaries, which are in this case, all the positive people or events that encourage children to do what they love. That could be their parents, for example, or caring teachers. In a more metaphorical manner, that could be their passion, interests, or their motivation. And finally, who or what are the opponents? And in this case, it's the more abstract idea of the traditional school system and the culture of failure, which tries to smother any form of creativity. Now that we've looked at the components, let's move on to the structure. What is the initial situation? 
Ken Robinson explains that all children are in fact creative. What is the cause for concern? Robinson explains that from the minute we enter the traditional school system, we try to fit a particular mold. A mold that frowns upon creativity and making mistakes, therefore eliminating any form of originality. What are the incidents that occur? As a school system is rigidly hierarchical, with maths and science at the top of the ladder, creativity is banished to the bottom, and the centering of making mistakes can lead to failure in the educational system. Therefore, children need to find a way to find success in what is perceived as failure. What is the resolution? The world is undergoing a revolution because our concept of intelligence has changed. It's beginning to embrace aspects like empathy and creativity more and more. So what is the resolved situation or solution? He suggests that we must create schools that can adapt to children's specific needs. If this structure seems a little too complicated to adapt to your situation, then you can summarize it in three points. Capturing attention with a starting point. Instigate a desire for change with a problem. Carry out the audience's commitment with a resolved situation or a solution. At this point, you should be ahead in your work process, as you should have already to hand a page with all the information about the context of your presentation, a page on which you have filled in three columns with before, during, and after, and finally a page where you have listed your components and structure. The good news is that the hardest part is done. Now we just need to fill in the gaps. And this can be done by adding real facts, such as figures or statistics, or even questions or anecdotes. A recent survey suggests that the thing we retain the most three days after attending a conference are the anecdotes. And this is exactly why peppering your speech with anecdotes can be particularly effective. So if we think back to Ken Robinson's speech, what sticks out in our memory the most? Well, you have the story of the little girl who becomes a world-renowned dancer or the joke about Shakespeare as a child. And yes, of course, your speech is not about anecdotes. Those anecdotes, however, will help you keep your audience interested, keep their attention up, and will make your speech more memorable. In order to try and make your speech more concrete, we recommend taking post-its in preferably three different colors. On one color, write down your ideas, on another, your facts or figures, and on the third, your anecdotes. This will allow you to reorganize your content and structure your speech in the best way that suits you. By using three different colors, you'll be able to see the main components of your talk and add anything that's missing, which is usually an anecdote. Once you have all your post-its laid out, you'll probably be thinking, how on earth am I going to remember all this? Well, there is a system of remembering important information, which is referred to as a mind map. A mind map is simply a mental map which you can liken to a tree trunk with branches. Those branches allow us to create and memorize our content more effectively. You will find more help on creating a mind map in the text of this chapter. But the main point you should remember is that your initial idea is your tree trunk and all the ideas that extend from that initial post-it are your branches, which represent the content of your speech. So that's it for the first part of this course. I'll see you after the quiz to discuss how you can correctly prepare yourself for a presentation. When giving a presentation or a speech, your content is extremely important. However, what a lot of people forget or indeed struggle with is that their body also sends messages to an audience. We refer to this as body language. Body language is non-verbal communication. The position of your body, the spacing of your legs, your arm movements and your facial expressions are all parts of it. For example, when you're stressed, you may cross your arms or tap your foot. Unfortunately, an audience can interpret these gestures to mean that you're either bored or that you don't want to be there. It can also look unprofessional. Let's look at some ways in which we can improve our body language. Standing and speaking in front of an audience can prove physically difficult, especially if you're not used to it. We have a tendency to get tired and to shift our body weight from one leg to the other, or to cross our legs, or to do a little dance, like so. This results in giving the audience the impression of instability, uneasiness, and even clumsiness. To correct that, you need to be well-centered. This means having a strong, stable standing position, 
It gives an air of greater confidence and power. Place your legs a little further than hip width apart. Remain loose and flexible. Your legs aren't tight and your knees aren't locked. Avoid slouching by keeping your back and head stretched and drawn up towards the sky. Imagine you have some kind of invisible thread pulling you upwards. Being centered does not mean staying still. Your legs are strong, but you can still move and make gestures with your arms to accompany your words. This brings us to another important point, managing your movements. If you have room to do so, you can walk. That being said, avoid walking for walking's sake. Make sure you have a destination. Wandering aimlessly for no apparent reason can become distracting. It can also reveal that your nerves are getting the better of you. One thing that you can do is to simply cross from one side of the stage to the other. Walk with purpose so that you can highlight transition in your speech. When you change topic a few minutes later, walk back again. This is useful for a variety of reasons. It changes perspective, allows you to catch your breath, but above all, it allows you to make a transition between two parts of your talk. In the audience's mind, it marks a change which will help them follow the thread of your story. Now, how about managing gestures? Good gestures begin with the palm of your hands facing upwards towards the audience. Your arms should make full, rounded gestures, not closed ones. Like this, you can't keep your arms folded. Keep your arms springy, not glued to your body. Spread them a few centimeters away. Also, your arms or hands shouldn't hide your face when you move. Your movement should be full, but not exaggerated. This can sometimes be difficult if you're used to speaking with your hands. In that case, use the energy that you have from your nerves or the passion that you have from your speech and control those gestures. Use them to give examples such as firstly, secondly, thirdly, or to make your audience feel included, like so. Things not to do. Don't fold your arms in front or clasp them behind your back. Don't lead on a table or a lectern. Don't click your pen or fiddle with an object as that can irritate and distract your audience. All of these movements give the impression of boredom or lack of confidence. They have the effect of cutting you off from the audience. Now, who should you look at? Don't fix your gaze on one single person the whole time. That will make the rest of the audience feel that you are addressing just that person. It could also make that person overwhelmed and embarrassed. Instead, include your audience. Sweep the room, resting your gaze at several points. To do this, you can follow the W pattern. For example, rest your gaze for a few seconds on one person, then pass to another, and so on, until you reach the furthest point of the audience. When you reach the end, sweep the audience in the other direction. You can also change the direction of the W. Make everybody feel included, not just your boss or the people that you think are important. Look, speak, then look again and speak again. Last but not least, remember to smile. Smile with your mouth, but also with your eyes. If your eyes don't smile, your smile will be forced. If you're not happy to be there, then the audience won't want to be there either. Remember, we're not necessarily born with good body language. It's something that gets better with practice and experience. So practice, put your knowledge to use, and you'll have the audience on your side in no time. Language is about what you say, but also how you say it. This can completely change your audience's perception of content when delivering a presentation. Beyond choosing a suitable register for your audience when speaking, it's important to be aware of linguistic tics. Linguistic tics refer to things that one repeats endlessly without even being aware of it. These are often connecting words such as like, basically, actually, so, and then, and or sounds such as uh, clearing one's throat or small intakes of breath. To give you an example, I'd like to ask my friend Ibis to help us. So Ibis, I'd like you to look into the camera and I'd like you to talk to us about something that you're really into. It could be a book, a series, or even your plans for the future. Well, um, I'm going to talk to you about um, Star Trek. Star Trek um, explores 
fundamentally um, all the questions about what it means to be human. Um, and basically, um, it's, uh, it takes you through um, the, what it means to be human, feelings, thoughts, um, and it gives you an optimistic, utopian vision of the future. Instead of breathing or using punctuation, Ibis used a lot of verbal tics. In order to minimize your own verbal tics, you need to become aware of them. This way you can first learn to hear them and then work to change them. If you're not sure you have any linguistic tics, film yourself. Take a subject that you haven't prepared or written down and talk to the camera just like Ibis. So if your tics are words, prepare synonyms in advance. Make yourself use them in your talk. If your tics are sounds, replace them with silent pauses and breaths. Ibis, could you tell your story again? Only this time, try to eliminate any tics you might have. Star Trek explores the fundamental questions about what it means to be human, our place in the universe. It also offers an optimistic vision of the future of humanity. That's a big part of its enduring appeal. Much better. In general, the better you've prepared your content, the more your tics will disappear. Practicing and training yourself in speaking will help you learn to control them. Preparation also helps to overcome stress and uncertainty. You'll also manage any improvisation more effectively. It's an excellent way of progressively eliminating bad habits. You're going to watch Star Trek now. <laughs> <laughs> At a conference, the audience tends to be quite large. It could be 100, 200, or even 400 people. The more people there are, the more stressful it becomes. That's why out of all the possible contexts and situations, speaking at a conference is probably the most stressful. We often refer to stage fright when talking about speaking in public. Your heart begins to beat quickly, your palms begin to sweat, and you lose your breath. Don't worry, it's normal and it's inevitable. All it is really is the fear of judgment. What is useful to understand is that this stress is ironically quite useful. The presence of stress reminds you that this speech is important to you and that you want to do a good job. In a sense, there are stakes, either personal or professional. That nervous energy pushes you to do a good job and impress your audience. Use it to your advantage to make your speech passionate and well understood. Perhaps you're afraid of certain side effects of stage fright. It could be going red, sweating, or tripping up when going on stage. These things might happen and sometimes you can't avoid them. In this case, accept them lovingly as part of you. If you go red, for example, the audience might notice for a second but if you ignore it and continue confidently with passion and persuasion, the audience will go along with you. And the fact that you went red will not be an issue at all. In any case, the best exercise to do before going on stage is breathe. Take long, deep breaths. This will help your heart rate slow down and will give you some time to regroup before you begin. Now, once you find yourself on stage, how do you go about maintaining your energy? standing correctly and looking at a large audience. Let's take a look at the best way to present yourself on stage. First of all, let's look at the arms. You shouldn't fold or place your arms behind your back. You shouldn't put your hands in your pockets. Don't let your arms drop to the side of your body either. Move your arms and hands in a natural manner and use gestures that go with your talk. Things that you should also avoid doing, touching your hair, touching your ring, bracelet or watch, or playing with a pen that you might be holding. This can often aggravate your audience. So what should you do? Firstly, unfold your arms and gesture. Always try to keep your arms midway and no lower than your belt. 
Speakers tend to move their arms too high, which can cover your face or become too distracting. Another factor to consider is the use of equipment and more importantly, the use of a microphone. Microphones can be a little bit difficult if you're not used to using them. Let's look at some examples of the best way to hold a microphone. In the case that you are not wearing a lapel microphone, you will be holding a handheld microphone. Firstly, you should hold the microphone with your whole hand and not just your fingers. Avoid covering the top, also as that might interfere with the sound. Secondly, you should move the microphone closer to your face. Try to keep it about a centimeter from your chin. Keep in mind that the closer it is, the clearer the sound will be. With the best preparation in the world, we can sometimes find ourselves coping with the unexpected. So what do we do when that happens? Coping with a technical issue happens frequently. The best thing to do is to arrive at the location early, at least 45 minutes before. This will allow you to find the premises manager and find out what equipment you will have at your disposal and to test the equipment, such as the microphone, so you feel more comfortable using it. If you will be using slides to go with your presentation, you will be able to discuss the use of a remote, for example. Another common phenomenon is the infamous memory lapse. Memory lapses are not necessarily serious, as sometimes the audience isn't even aware of them. The first thing to do when you feel a memory lapse coming is breathe. By taking a moment to breathe, it allows both you and the audience to regroup your thoughts. Keep in mind that the audience isn't willing you to fail. They're human, just like you. In the majority of cases, they empathize and they want you to succeed. In the next chapter, we'll be looking at delivering a presentation in a different situation, presenting a lesson to a class. Let's have a look. The setup for a class is completely different to that of a talk or a lecture. Firstly, the audience is generally smaller. Secondly, the room is much smaller and the speaker is closer to the audience. This brings the advantage of greater closeness to the audience and is more favorable to interactions. Presenting a lesson to a class is usually less stressful than giving a presentation to an audience, but on the other hand, can be much more tiring as it is usually longer and can be quite repetitive, especially if you're giving back-to-back -back lessons. It is quite important to keep your energy levels up, as if you begin to tire, your class will tire with you and your message will be lost. A good night's sleep and a healthy diet is the best recommendation. One of the first things you need to do is create a certain link or interaction with your students. In order to create this interaction, the best piece of advice is to try your best to memorize your students' names. If you're in a class of 30 students, that can be a little bit more challenging, but by asking them to place a name card in front of them, it could help. By memorizing their names, it helps you personalize your interaction with the students. They will feel special, and it will be easier to get their attention when asking a question or having them interact with another student. Another important factor before starting a class is the organization of the class itself. Arriving at least 15 minutes before will allow you to review your notes, but also to rearrange the classroom as you see fit. You might choose a U shape or a more traditional row format. You could even try to create islands of tables. Depending on the style of class you are giving, it can promote interaction between the students themselves. Another common question is, how and where should I stand when giving a class? Traditionally, people sit behind their desk and give their class. This can seem a little old fashioned and the desk often cuts off the student and teacher. I suggest standing up in front of the desk or slightly leaning your back against the desk like so, depending on the image you want to portray. Concerning your walking movements, Avoid walking back and forth across the room and looking at the floor or at one specific student. Move every time you transition into a new theme or subject that merits crossing the room. When moving, look at the student in the direction that you are taking. Use them as your anchor point and walk and look at them like so. Remember to not walk for walking's sake. Anchor yourself at your point A, and when necessary, move to point B using the advice that we have previously seen. As we saw in previous chapters, 
unexpected circumstances can arise. Laptops and smartphones are unavoidable or sometimes necessary for the students. The disadvantage for the speaker is that sometimes you can find your student's attention going elsewhere and that can really put you off. It is a bit of a tough issue, but the best recommendation is to begin the lesson by asking everybody to close their laptops and put their phones away. If, however, your class requires students to take notes, I recommend alternating sections of the class where notes can be taken and others where laptops must be closed. Another way of keeping your audience's attention is to regularly ask various students questions. It allows everybody to sit a little bit on the edge of their seat, anticipating that they might be asked the following question. Nobody wants to be shown that they weren't listening. In all cases, it is important to set some ground rules before beginning. Mobile should be silenced and put away, and if an urgent call needs to be made, then they can excuse themselves and leave the room. It is important that the class is a space that is dedicated to the work that is being done that day. Remember too that in order to grab your audience's attention and keep it, you need to use the method of storytelling that we spoke about in previous chapters. It is essential to keep your presentation on track. Remember to add anecdotes again and again, and soon you'll soon notice that you really maintain your audience's attention and get them on your side. In the next chapter, we'll be taking a look at another situation, delivering a presentation to camera.